to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today we're doing a special issue or a special episode. Uh, my guest is uh, Mr. Dennis Clift. Dennis is our Executive Vice President for Operations here at the Naval Institute. He's been working at the Naval Institute for about, what, a decade or so? Oh, yes, since about 2010. And uh, Dennis... That's my second tour. Dennis... It, EVP for operations is not really the title that we should give to Dennis. It should be elder statesman, um, ambassador, and international man of mystery, because Dennis has had an incredible life. Um, and the, the genesis for this conversation today was, you know, Jimmy Carter's health is in the news. President Carter has gone into hospice care, we understand, down in Plains, Georgia. Uh, President Carter is a Naval Academy graduate. He was a submarine officer. Uh, before he uh, left the Navy and went back to uh, Georgia and got into politics and eventually became the president. Um, but Dennis, uh, earlier in his career, served on the National Security uh, staff, and you were the National Security Advisor to Vice President... Walter F. Mondale. Yes, I was on the NSC, um, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, um, but... In the Carter administration, I was the national security advisor to Vice President Walter F. Mondale, Fritz Mondale. So we were talking about Camp David. We were talking about the uh, uh, Israeli-Egyptian peace accords because that's been that certainly is part of President Carter's legacy. And Dennis was. Uh, we were at our staff meeting yesterday, and Dennis was sharing some stories uh, from Camp David and from the high-level negotiations that were happening between Menachem Begin the Israeli Prime Minister, and uh, the Egyptian leader at that Anwar time, Sadat. Anwar Sadat. So, so Dennis, I, I'm curious, uh, what, was, what was Jimmy Carter's role in that peace negotiation? Was it something that was, you know, was Carter the driving force? Or was this a State Department thing that had been long desired for U.S. You know, foreign policy and Carter was on board with it? What was his, you know, his role? Carter was very definitely the driving force. And stepping back just a little bit, in 1967, there was a six-day war. And after Israel was attacked, it counterattacked and took over the Sinai Peninsula west of the Nile. It took over the Gaza Strip. It took over the East Bank from Jordan. And it took over the Golan Heights from um, Syria. And then UN Resolution 242 was passed later that year, 67, calling for the return of occupied territories as part of a peaceful negotiation. People have been trying since then, 67, until Carter got elected in 77, and now in 78, was pushing hard to see if he could not get the Egyptian leader, Sadat, and the Israeli leader, Begin, to agree to a peace settlement. Amazing. Um, so what were the major sticking points between the two sides as, as you got these two national leaders to, to even contemplate coming together and having a, a, a presidential level summit, if you will? Um, what were the major uh, sticking points in the, in the timeline leading up to Camp David? Well, of interest, one of the major sticking points was that um, the Israeli leader, Menachem Begin, who himself had been a warrior in their battle for independence, really didn't trust Carter. Um, mm -hmm. Carter was impressed by the fact that Sadat had gone to Jerusalem in November of 1977, just taken the bold step of going to Jerusalem and proposing direct talks. And Jimmy Carter was very impressed by that and was pushing, and Begin sort of felt that Carter might be somewhat in the Arab camp. And um, it made him uneasy. But my role with Mondale, if I could step back for just a minute, yeah, of course. Um, Mondale um, was a unique vice president. Um, Carter and Mondale revolutionized the vice presidency, moving the vice president at, the vice pre at Mondale's proposed proposal before they actually took office getting the VP out of the Senate office building where he sat waiting to break tie votes once every nine months, um, and getting him down to the west wing of the White House, making him, as Carter would say, truly second in command. 
involved in all issues, domestic and foreign policy, and playing a major role in those issues. And so um, Mondale had this major role, and as part of that, um, this was spring of 78, and we were coming up on the Israeli 30th independence anniversary following their winning independence in um, 1948. Yeah. And um, Mondale was asked by Carter, one, to lead a very large, impressive U.S. delegation to celebrate with the Israelis, and two, to take personal letters from him to Begin and then to Sadat, um, proposing that they meet um, and encouraging them to agree. And when Begin greeted Mondale and the delegations at Tel Aviv, we then made the drive through the mountains to Jerusalem. I might note passing all these hulks and relics of past wars now painted in red lead paint. And on that drive, Mondale persuaded Begin that Carter was a true, true believer in Israel and that he should trust him. And Begin would later, later say that that drive with Mondale changed his mind and he would agree as part of that visit to have a meeting with Sadat. That then meant, okay, wow, that was important. So we changed our itinerary and flew on in Air Force Two to Alexandria, Egypt to meet with Sadat. And he was at his beautiful Mediterranean seaside villa, great lawns and lovely buildings. And we sat out in the sun and Mondale met with Sadat. What was fun about that was that Sadat had two huge chimpanzees, pet chimpanzees, <laughs> in a big cage. And they were screaming and yelling the whole time that these talks were going on. And sometimes it made it a little bit hard to hear what the other party was saying. But Sadat agreed. Then Secretary of State Vance um, met with the foreign ministers of Egypt and Israel and it was agreed by all that we would have a summit. Carter would host a summit at Camp David in September 1978. So shuttle diplomacy, uh, Mondale is a big part of setting up and, and, and winning the trust, uh, particularly of, of Begin, who felt uh, that, that perhaps Carter was taking the, the Arab side or was going to you know, weigh in on that side a little harder. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's interesting. There's a news verification of that. There was a very young reporter in those days. Mind you, this is 78, and there was a guy working for the Jerusalem Post named Wolf Blitzer, um, and his stories for the Jerusalem Post, he told that story of Begin's changing his mind during that drive um, based on his talks with Israeli sources. Interesting, interesting. So uh, in addition to you know, all three leaders having to trust each other and sense that they could get out of this something that would be equitable, right? Um, what were some of the sticking points before you could bring the national leaders together that had to be decided on the ground? I mean, you, you mentioned in the 67 war, uh, Israel uh, you know, had large swaths of the Sinai, right? So there was territory, there were the, you know, ever famous um, settlements, Israeli settlements in Arab territory or Palestinian territory. So what were some of those major sticking points that led up to uh, the, the 78 Camp David um, agreement? Well, I would say, you know, Israel had taken possession of the Gaza Strip um, on the um, Med. Israel had taken possession of the West Bank, which had normally been where Jerusalem is, all the holy sites, and Israel had taken the Golan Heights. But most important in terms of sticking points was the big triangular peninsula, the Sinai Peninsula. And in that Sinai Peninsula, which Israel now occupied, it had air bases, mm -hmm. and formal air bases, and it also had settlements of Israeli settlers. And Sadat said, if we are to have peace, Israel must leave the Sinai. And Begin essentially said, we cannot do that. And so that's the way we came into this. Let me just note, how did I get to Camp David as National Security Advisor of Vice President Mondale? Carter said, I am going to 
lock Camp David down. I'm not going to allow any reporters up there. If you're talking and you make any progress and you have reporters, it's going to be reported in Egypt or in Israel, and one side or the other will raise the dickens and say, that's no good, stop all of that. So Carter said there will be no reporters, and he said the staffs will be absolutely the minimum number required. Mm -hmm. I am going to make this a tight, sealed, 24-hour-a-day negotiation until we make it work, hopefully. And um, he said to Vice President Mondale Fritz, I want you to be in Washington running the government while I'm up here, and whenever you get time, grab a helicopter and come on up and join the talks. We value your input. And um, Mondale said, Mr. President, I will do that, and I have one request. May my national security advisor, Dennis Clift, be up there all the time so that he can keep me spun up on how the talks are progressing and so that when I arrive, I can step right in and move ahead and not be trying to catch up. Carter said, agreed. And so that's why I was up there at Camp David. So these are the days before email, before internet, before texting. So Before this, cell phones. Yeah. So is this a, a, a nightly phone call that you would have with the vice president? How did you keep uh, VP Mondale up to it, date it, on what it, was It happening? would be um, print messages, um, and um, it would also be... Um, briefing him when he came up I would meet his helicopter down at the landing pad at Camp David and then as we were driving in um, to the summit area of Camp David I would spin him up en route so that you know I wasn't spending too much of his time but he would know I'd say sir you have to understand this 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 and this he said got it and that's why we would that's how we would do that gotcha uh, how many days or weeks were the leaders at Camp David? The leaders were at Camp David from September 7 until September 17. And um, Carter sat down with both of them in the first day of talks. And by the end of the third day of those 10 days, he found he was getting nowhere with trilateral talks between him and both Begin and Sadat. So we moved to bilateral, working with Begin, then working with Sadat. And we had our staffs, um, under Secretary Vance, the most talented people in the business. And their job was to help take ideas that were coming out of Aspen, the president's cabin, and trying to turn them into language that could become treaty language that could become diplomatic language mm. that could be used. And so it was, um, Vance worked almost as hard as Carter. I've, I've described him as a destroyer skipper in combat. And he used to ride around, he had hurt his back years before, and he used to ride a little golf cart up and down the paths of Camp David, moving from talk to talk and um, helping the president as best as he could. And he helped him very, very much. Amazing to think of three world leaders in one place for 10 days. It's almost unimaginable today. And not allowed, not allowed. Begin, after the talks, described the experience as a concentration camp deluxe. Um, not allowing them out and keeping minimum, keeping, having a promise from them that yes, they could communicate with their bases, their, their home capitals, but they should not communicate with the press. And he had that agreement. And White House Press Secretary Jody Powell um, had the US press down at the foot of Camp David um, at Thurmont, Maryland. And that's where the press headquarters was, several miles away. And Jody would go down and brief them, I guess, usually with non-talk. Uh, right. Let me say this about that. That's right, yes, got it, got it. Um, <laughs> What's, what's a humorous anecdote or two from that time at Camp David? What were, what were some funny sort of side conversations or, you know, comments on food or what, what, what have you? Well, you know, when you're up there locked in together, there can be lots of humor. Um, I remember I just mentioned Jody Powell, and he was this wonderful Georgian. And one afternoon during a break in the talks, we were in one of the lodges. Camp David has about 12 big lodges where guests stay in addition to the president's Aspen Lodge. Mm. 
and um, Jody was just tearing his hair out. He said, doggone it, he said, Willie Nelson is down at the White House singing this evening, and I won't be able to hear him. And he sings Georgia so beautifully, I won't be able to hear him. <laughs> um, there were Very often, the Israelis would invite me to join them for drinks. And the Israeli delegation was not your usual delegation. It included the incredible warrior Moshe Dayan, who had the eye patch from his previous battles, and he was now foreign minister. It included Azar Weizmann, an ace Israeli pilot who had headed the Israeli Air Force and now was Minister of Defense. And those guys and I would be sitting there enjoying an evening drink and telling stories. And Diane was a true believer in archaeology and in writing about the ancient lands in which he lived. And he was complaining to me one day about New York publishers. He said, you know, they keep trying to knock me down on the prices they're willing to offer for my new books. <laughs> I said, hey, sir, I grew up in New York City. I know New York City. I worked for the New York Daily News as a teenager. I, I went to a Quaker school. And this being Manhattan, half of the students were of the Jewish religion. Manhattan has a lot of Jewish people. And Diane is listening to me. He's just a foot away in his chair, and he gets up, walks the step to me, and pounds me on my right shoulder with his right hand, and I say, he says, I hereby declare you an honorary Jew. And that was <laughs> one of my honors of being at Camp David. Just one other story. On the 17th, the Sunday, when all had been sort of tacked together, Begin finally said, I will agree to withdraw the air bases from the Sinai if the U.S. will help me with the building of bases in the Israeli Negev Desert. Mm -hmm. And I will agree to withdraw settlements from the Sinai if I present it to our Knesset, our parliament, and if the parliament approves negotiations on that basis. So that was all tacked down and on Sunday morning, I was in one of the lodges, and Carter suddenly popped in out of the blue. He said, where do I find Azar Weizmann? I said, sir, we went outside. I said, it's that cabin right there. He said, thank you, and off he sped. And um, then Weizmann came to the door, sort of in his underpants and T-shirt, waving his arms, telling the president, don't come in, don't come in, it's a mess. And Carter roared laughing. But I would learn later that Carter, leaving nothing to chance, wanted to talk to Weizmann about making sure that as defense minister, he would work with the Knesset to have the Knesset agree to do what had just been negotiated. Uh, so Dennis, I noticed you're wearing your Camp David jacket, and on the Camp David crest, there's two Navy anchors. Uh, what's the connection? Obviously, you know, we, we've already talked about Jimmy Carter and his connection with the Naval Academy and serving in the Navy, and then being at Camp David, but I'm sure that's not where that came from. The Navy anchors go back to the heritage of Camp David, which was a set of cabins built up during the Depression. And in the late 30s, early 40s, before we entered World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt used to love to cruise on the Potomac in his yacht, the Potomac. And he had, obviously, Navy crew. And the Secret Service said, Mr. President, we can no longer allow you to go out on that yacht. There are submarines, German submarines, being spotted further down in the Chesapeake, and we cannot risk you. And FDR must have breathed a deep, sad sigh because there was no air conditioning in those days. Washington was steaming hot, and he loved to get out on the water to cool off. His staff found these cabins up in the mountains of Maryland, and it was cooler up there. And they said they had two problems. One, how are we going to staff the president if we get up there? Someone said, why not take the stewards from his yacht, the Navy uh. stewards? And so up they went, and um, they set the precedent of having the Navy run Camp David 
and the Navy continues to run it to this day. Therefore, we have the two anchors on the patch. I would, the other problem the Secret Service had was, how are we going to drive Roosevelt those 60-some miles um, out of Washington up and up into Maryland? Um, and one of them said, wait a minute. Secret Service was in the Treasury Department then. When we nabbed Al Capone, we took his armored limousine. Let's drive the president up to Camp David in the armored limousine that was Al Capone's. And that's the way FDR first used to travel to Camp David. Well, I want to come back uh, quickly to today's environment. So we talked about Camp David. We talked about the 78 peace accord between uh, Egypt and Israel, uh, which was contentious, which was difficult, and is also one of the longest lasting peace treaties and, and perhaps most meaningful of the last you know, 50 or 100 years, uh, with the, the Russia-Ukraine war entering year two today. It's been a year since the invasion. Um, how does this end? Are there lessons from the, the Camp David negotiations of 46 years ago, 45 years ago, for you know, how the Russia-Ukraine war might end? Well, let me be very brief, and that is I think it has to be a negotiated agreement between Russia and the Ukraine. Independent Ukraine, independent Russia, and a Ukraine which has a very deep place in the heritage in Russia before Ukraine became independent. The Russians, in fact, took back part of it about 10 years ago or so, which has their base of Sevastopol on the Black Sea. But I think there has to be a negotiated agreement um, because neither side can just say, I give up at this point. Um, they are going to continue fighting unless the Camp David negotiated settlement is the route to follow. You mentioned the Sinai Peninsula being one of those major contentious issues uh, of the Israeli-Egyptian war and, and that, that peace settlement. And um, it, it would seem to be to me that that's, that's a good analogy for some of perhaps the seized territory between the two on the Eastern Front. Um, but, you know... My, my feeling is and I'm just one person on this, but my feeling is there has to be some agreement on those areas bordering the Black Sea, which were part of Russia, which were part of the Soviet Union, then became part of independent um, Ukraine, and today are the subject of the principal fighting in eastern Ukraine. There is going to have to be some sort of negotiated understanding where both side gives a bit if we're going to see peace. That's my feeling. Yeah, great points. All right. Well, uh, my guest today has been Mr. Dennis Clift. He's the Executive Vice President for Operations at the Naval Institute. He's also our scholar in residence. And for those who've been following proceedings so far this year, Dennis is the author of the Heritage Sections, as we've gone back 150 years in the pages of proceedings each month Dennis is the one who's gone back in our archives and pulled out those amazing quotes, amazing um, proceedings Article. articles yes. from the 1880s and 1890s and the last century. Just great, great work. So, Dennis, it's always a pleasure to work with you and to talk to you and to hear your stories. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much.